the way I would frame it up is you need to think about it as much as an energy test as an aptitude test. And if you don't think the energy part is important, then don't do it. But the best people in my portfolio, the ones that I brag about, the ones that I hire multiple times in multiple companies, the ones that like make me proud, they're not just smart. They have incredible energy and they're excited about the very unique type of work that goes on inside of a Parker Gale portfolio company. Some people complain about the assessment that I use to search for that unique kind of energy. That's fine. I'm okay with that. Initiating becoming a hiring machine sequence in three, two, one. Hey everyone, it's Sam Keenly and welcome back to Becoming a Hiring Machine. This is the show dedicated to fixing recruitment by going beyond saying what needs to change and instead teaches you how to make that change. Today, we've got an amazing interview ahead of us, but before we get into that, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the show. Essentially, we have shows within the show here. Some days like today, we have interviews with industry thought leaders and others who are shaking up the space, while other days we cover things like trending topics. Uh, stop by every Tuesday for a Tactical Tuesday episode where we go deep on how to do something that's going to help you drive better results in your day to day. Some days we open it up for Q&A, and then other days we have Matt drop by for a mic drop episode where he shares something that he's been thinking about within the recruitment space and wants you to know. All right, today's interview. Like I said, I am excited about this one because it's a really fascinating topic that I've been itching to get into, but I needed the right guest for it. And so today we're finally gonna be able to make that happen. So the topic is how do you avoid making a bad hire when you literally cannot afford to make a bad hire? So think about startups, especially when they have limited funding, short runways, things like that. And then our guest is Paul Stancic. So he's a partner at Parker Gale, which is a small private equity firm, and they focus on technology companies. Uh, more specifically, he's responsible for working with the leaders of their portfolio companies to help improve their growth strategies and their leadership team effectiveness, which is an interesting little part there. So prior to joining, he also worked in the leadership and talent practice at Bain & Company. So he's got, he's got that big corporate cred behind his name. So great topic, even better guest. And he's got a framework that we're going to dive into that every recruiter will be able to learn a thing or two from. So pull out your pen and paper or your notes app if you're like me, and let's get into it. So Paul, welcome. Sam, thanks, man. That was a great intro. Yeah, well, hey, you got an interesting background. Like, I always <laughs> like to tee it up so people know what they're getting into with the uh, with the conversation. I try to avoid the, like, what's a fun fact about yourself? I'm like, eh, that's cool, but whatever. So people kind of have a background about you. Before we get into just this whole concept of, like, you can't afford to make a bad hire, anything else about your background or, or things that you, you think are worthwhile to, to add in? No, the thing that comes to mind is, like, I think we're in the early innings of this private equity operating team thing. And a lot of my writing that I share online is on the topic of just what do operating partners do and what are some of the things that work for us that I think you can apply to any business or any team. But I do think I'm a little bit unique in that I've actually had two operating partner jobs in my time at Parker Gale. So when I started here about half a decade ago, I was actually hired to run talent. So our partners recognized the need to hire better inside the portfolio, bring our leadership teams a little bit closer together and make sure we were grading uh, our talent fairly, but rigorously. And so we had some processes in place that seemed to be working, but we wanted to take those things to the next level. So my first 18 months in this job was all about kind of the talent life cycle, including how do we hire better? But I'm a recovering sales guy, right? <laughs> um, and you'll probably pick up on that as the podcast goes along. And 12 to 18 months in, I just kept getting pulled into more go-to-market focused problems and opportunities inside our portfolio. Uh, and I finally raised my hand and I said, hey, you know, our company's selling revenue multiples. Who around the table is responsible for improving revenue? And what's that saying in poker? Like if you look around the table and you don't see the sucker, like it's you. Mm -hmm. I kind of had that moment where I said, okay, this is probably where I need to put my energy and this should be my full-time job. And thankfully, the rest of the partners here at Parker Gale agreed. And so for the last four years, I've been almost 100% focused on growth. But I do think I bring this dual lens to the job of operating partner where I've done the job of spending 100% of my time thinking about talent. And now I'm doing the job spending most of my time thinking about growth. But I appreciate and I empathize with and I know a thing or two about how those two things intersect. And that helps me put a unique spin on the weirdest gig that I've ever loved. Yeah. Well, good. So do you think that because you did the talent within the organization for all and you have a, a framework and playbook that we get into that having that in place is what allowed you to step away from it a little bit and be comfortable with whoever uh, was able to take that on from you? Yeah, totally. I, I think one of the things you have to be good at full stop in this job is 
diving in and doing a job when it's needed to be done inside of the portfolio, sometimes at an individual contributor level, and then finding a way to fire yourself from that gig a few weeks or a few months later. Mm -hmm. So I think you're exactly right. Like my goal was to build on some of the things that were already working for us. And honestly, some of the things that attracted me to Parker Gale as I was being recruited, make those a little bit more easy to share, codify them, cement them a little bit more, and then step back as that knowledge and as that way of doing things was a little bit more cemented. But I think, yeah, a big part of this job is building the playbook, which doesn't necessarily mean, hey, here's the way you absolutely have to do something. I think it's much more about capturing the principles and the earned secrets of how you do something repeatedly and, uh, and effectively. I think we've done that with our hiring handbook. That doesn't mean it hasn't changed. I mean, we're, we're changing the way that we write our profiles right now. So if you go to our website and you download the hiring handbook, it's a little bit dated in the sense that the way that we market our roles and the way that we set up our hiring process, which I'm sure we'll get into, um, it looks a little different now than it did a few years ago. And part of that is because one, I think we're good at making the space to reflect on what's working and what isn't and how we can move things forward. Uh, but two, we build feedback loops in so we can tell um, like, hey, this is the thing that needs some attention and needs some TLC and needs updating over time. Because you and I both know, you know, a playbook is not a static uh, evergreen thing. Like the minute you publish it uh, is the minute you should start thinking about how can you update it. Yeah. I love that. Okay. We're going to come back to that. I yeah. promise that one. Um, okay. So to set the stage with all of this, um, so you work in the PE space. My former company, I was at a marketing agency, worked with tons of startups that were PE back, VC back through through corporate. And I would hear time and time again, I'm sure you hear the exact same thing. It's just like that we can't afford to make a bad hire, but then you watch them go through this typical process of like, okay, let's write a really bad job description, post yep. it to our website, let people go on LinkedIn, easy apply. Yep. And you go and select the best candidate from that like pool of couple hundred. And so that's why I really enjoyed seeing your background, the framework that you got on this, because you understand like you really cannot afford to make a bad hire. And there are things that you can do to get ahead of that. It's not just like, okay, post it to a job board and anything else. And so I know there's gonna be tons of excuses out there. I'm going to start up. We can't afford to use a recruiter. They're too expensive. We're scrappy. We've got it. Or like, you know, our CEO, his, his daughter, her son is a recruiter. We can just use them and they can do it for us and it'll be yeah. good enough. So yep. like all of those, I those know different a guy. scenarios. I know a guy yeah. is another good excuse. Like, hey, we don't need to do one a recruiting process because I know a guy. Yeah, exactly. So before we get into like the playbook itself, I guess through your experience and everything, like what was the aha moment when you realized, especially that like this process, this hiring process does not work if you do have fast timelines to hire or you have a, a specific high bar that you need to withhold? It's it's a good question. I mean, I've kind of just always been fascinated by assessment and selection. Like I think I've always known intrinsically that the teams and the organizations that I've been really impressed by tend to have really strong filters for who gets to be a part of them, right? Like I grew up playing sports being part of tryouts as a part of playing sports, went through recruiting process to play in college and professionally. And I just kind of like took for granted that that was a part of being part of a strong team, but you're mm -hmm. right. It, it doesn't exist everywhere in the corporate world. And I think the guy who articulates both the importance of that principle of like taking hiring seriously and digs into some of the psychological reasons why is a guy named Dan Coyle. So he wrote a book called The Culture Code, which if you haven't read it, press pause, go read it and come back to this conversation because you'll get a lot out of it. And it's probably my most recommended book on this, on this topic. But one of his takeaways in the book is that all of these cultures and all of these high performance organizations that any of us would recognize is kind of like the cream of the crop. So he, he dives into everybody from the Navy SEALs to Pixar to New Zealand All Blacks to like everybody from the world of sports mm -hmm. and society and business. Um, one of the things that makes them different is they spend a ton of time on these who's in and who's out decisions. And they're, the level of attention and detail and caring and just giving a crap about what that process looks like and who makes it through is just different when you look at an organization that's doing really special things. Um, and the way that they decide who's in and who's out tends to be 
different organization to organization, but that level of precision and care tends to be really, really high in the places that have that level of, of prestige. And I, I, getting back to your question, like, I don't think there was a moment for me mm -hmm. after joining Parker Gale, but there was something culturally here that goes back to kind of how we do what we do. Like we do one or two deals a year. Um, and we talk to our executives, like we kind of make the same point. Like we look for the company that's special and we do a lot of homework to pick out the one in a hundred that looks like a Parker Gale company and the companies that get to be a part of what we do and the people that get to be a part of those teams are special and they're different. And so that process that we want our companies to use and the process that we use who gets to be on the management team to run the business and who gets to be inside the business doing the work that we think is going to help finish the work that the founder started. That process that picks that person out and finds that person and assesses that person and gets them excited, that needs to be a special process too, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this great quote by, I think it's Penn and Teller, the, the magicians. Mm -hmm. um, and they say, sometimes magic is just spending way more time on something than anybody else would be willing to do. And that's how we feel about hiring. This stuff is important. Like, yes, it contributes to a stronger company, better performance, all that. But on some level, like you're also sending a signal about the type of team that you are mm -hmm. when you decide how you're gonna run a hiring process. And every person that you add to your team says something about who you are. And I think I really, really, yeah, like go ahead. You go. really, really special organizations, they recognize that, they take that seriously, and they're very conscious of that signal that they're sending when they finally wake up and realize like, hey, it's time to, to add somebody else to our team. And I just think that that is a very powerful, but almost impossible to measure leading indicator for what leads to a strong team. And it happens one hire at a time. So maybe that's more of a woo woo answer than you're looking for, but it's authentic and it's real. And it's kind of what we've learned over the past five years. And we can talk about the more concrete reasons that we think it's important and we spend so much time on it. But I think that signal that you're sending, like I'm gonna communicate the type of team that we are and the uniqueness of what we're trying to accomplish in how we decide who's in and who's out how we define what we're looking for and how we shepherd people through that process to figure out who's the one that we're going to pick to be a part of this. I think there's just something mm -hmm. cool about that. Yeah. It's very underrated and I want to say overlooked. I just don't think people think about it enough per se. And this is something, so this topic of talent density is starting to come up more and more, right? And yep. My last organization, I remember this because we would open up roles and we would go out and actively find people that we thought would be a great fit for the team. And one, we'd get candidates that came into us that were great fits. They were a very high bar. They would meet what we want. But the number of times we would reach out to people that we knew who could have been really strong within the organization had this sense of imposter syndrome because they saw that bar that we have with the team and they're like, I didn't think I was good enough for it. Yeah, yeah. And so that was the, it was the, I mean, to illustrate your point, people recognize that and see that they definitely do. So um, not to say it's a con about it, but like it's very perceivable by the, the market that you want to attract if you're able to do that well. 100%. And there are times where you kind of have to talk candidates into like, no, we think you have what it takes and it's worth just throwing your hat in the ring because, mm -hmm. you know, for instance, the way that we write profiles is very different. It can be very intimidating and there's kind of a different kind of bias that can creep into the process if you're not, if you're not careful. Right. So there is an art to this. Like there's a lot of science and organizational studies behind it and we could talk about all that, but yeah, like we we think we do this different. We think it, we take it seriously. When you look around at companies that are doing something special, they tend to take it seriously too. And I think there's mm -hmm. something to that. Yeah, and so you have a hiring process that you all use. I don't want to steal your thunder, but it at the surface level, it's it's four simple steps. You yep. do them and and everything else. So, do you want to break down? Let's start with just like list the four parts of the framework, and then we'll start to jump in. You know, from top to bottom, and and go into it. Yeah, we, we've already started talking about the first step because it's so important and you can't even, you know, get going on this conversation without touching it. But step one is know what you want. And a lot of people, you know, look at their budget and open up part of their budget to a new hire without ever knowing what they're actually looking for. And 
you can ask a lot of good questions. You can run a bunch of references. You can give people personality tests. But if you don't know what you want up front, you're kind of chop blocking yourself before the hiring process ever gets started. And so I think that starts with writing a better job description. We'll talk about that as we go along. But that is step one, and it's foundational to the whole thing. Uh, step two is like source your own candidates. Like you touched on this at the start of the conversation. If you're just sitting back and waiting for applicants to roll in, the best candidates tend to be pretty happy where they are. And you need to go out there and find them and convince them that you are worth talking to and that you can offer something that's a little different and a little more exciting than what they're working on today. That is a marketing exercise. And so you need to be comfortable with making marketing part of your candidate sourcing strategy and not just saying, post the job, wait and see what happens. Um, the third part is about how we assess people and we just say, be structured. So this is about being fair and it's about linking what you ask about in the talent acquisition process back to what you decided initially, what you're looking for. Sounds very easy. A lot of people don't do it. Um, so there's an art of asking questions, but I think the more important art is ma uh, matching what you ask to what you set up initially and what you're looking for in this role. And the fourth is the feedback loop. It's learning from who you hire. So not only assessing like, are you being effective in your hiring and are you getting better at adding people to your team versus last year, the year before that, but like, what kind of experience are you offering? And does this feel fair and dignified and exciting for people that are choosing to prepare for an interview and choosing to like throw themselves out there in a semi-vulnerable way and tell you their life story and tell you the things they're most proud of and tell you their weaknesses? Like there, that's a two-way street. Um, and there's a way to look into that process and quality control it, just like you can quality control your sales pipeline or your marketing lead flow or any other business process. I think a lot of people don't have that feedback loop in place and we think it's pretty important. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's four steps. They're all pretty basic. Know what you want, find your own candidates, be structured, and then learn from who you hire. When you do them together, uh, you know, one plus one plus one plus one equals more than four. We can talk a little bit about what I mean by that as we go along here. Yeah. Okay. So starting at the top, know what you want. Very easy to say, much harder to put into practice. So before we get into what you call performance profiles, when you say like, know what you want, are you talking about jobs to be done, job titles, job senioritys, like just very elementary. Let's, let's begin right there. Yeah. What, what are you hiring this person to do? You, you tend to have to ask that question three or four times to really get at beyond what's on the business card. Like there is work that's either falling on somebody else or not being done or not being done very well that you're going to hand to this person on the first day of work and say, hey, this is yours. And I think too often we look at new hires through the lens of the org chart and not through the lens of the results that we want them to accomplish. There's a box we got to fill Let's go fill the box with someone who's willing to give us a shot. Um, but like not enough companies ask themselves the question of like what's missing on our team. Uh, so like demand gen marketer is a good example, right? There, a lot of people say, hey, we need another marketing person on the team. Okay, well, what channels is this person going to manage? And do we already have activity in, you know, the world of PPC or SEM or on LinkedIn, or are they going to be doing this for the first time and running an experiment? And do they have people to help them or do they have to go figure this out themselves and then build a team out from under them? And do they report to the CMO or do they report directly to the CEO? Like not all titles are created equal. And so I think if you're stopping uh, short of defining the actual results that you want this person to create, and you're stopping short of sharing the context on how they fit into the rest of the organization and the broader mission that the company is on, like you don't actually know what you want. And this is the reason that we get these job descriptions that absolutely suck. They're just long lists of things that you might potentially do sometime if you came on board and spent a few years in the company, right? Mixed with like random qualifications and accreditations and like all the things that you need to put in the required box on LinkedIn to post a job. They're not actually like a, a spec. They're not actually a scope of work. They're not actually what you would ask a consultant to do if you were just hiring them for three to six months. So I, I think it's wild that people will hire a consultant or a fractional person and 
scope that role much more tightly and much more thoughtfully than they would for someone that might end up working there for 10 years. And part of the reason is like, this is hard. And the further out you go, the more uncertain a job becomes, especially in smaller emerging tech companies, right? Like chances are you'll have a different job in the first six to 12 months. But that's no excuse because if you don't actually sit down and say, what do you need this person to accomplish, finish, improve, diagnose, it's going to be impossible to assess who the best fit is for that job. And it's certainly going to be impossible to effectively onboard that person when they get in the company and tell them like, Hey, you're going to see a lot of different stuff, but this is the thing that matters the most. So we can talk about how we write these, but I think it's all the things you mentioned. I think, I think it's jobs to be done. I think it's the context on how this fits into the broader organization. And I think it's like, a sense of clarity on what matters most if they were to step foot inside your organization. And if you went and did a random sample of most job descriptions out there, they do not provide any of those things. They're just a document that you need to get past the workflow and the talent acquisition, uh, you know, posting exercise. You just put that so much better, so much more concise and eloquently <laughs> than I ever could. So thank you for that hard, hard stop recording on that one. <laughs> The point that you were saying specifically about how people are so good at scoping what they want fractionals, consultants, people to do versus a, a full-time employee, that's an interesting one because I wonder, it's like, are they looking at it because it's project basis, it's short-term time frame. So it's like, okay, well, in the next six months, here's what we have to do. It's much easier to scope that versus sometimes when you think for the full-time employee, well, I want them to be here for three years. So how do I say what I want them to do now, leave it open enough where it's still interesting for them without setting hard goals? Because what happens if we don't do well this year? What happens if we do really well this year? We don't want to undercut ourselves and, and give them a, a flaky goal. So Yeah, and you don't want to like turn yourself into a brain pretzel by examining all the possible mm -hmm. meta metaverse, you know, outcomes that could be possible 12 months from now. Like the more uncertain things become, the less useful long-term planning is. So I think getting specific in a short enough time frame and using good reflective questions to figure out like, what do you want this person to actually do mm -hmm. makes it easier, right? So if yeah. you want a few of those questions, like I'm going to cheat here and, and read off our hiring handbook. So if people want this, like go download it, it's free. A couple thousand people have already done that. And nobody's complained yet. So maybe we'll <laughs> get one, but so here's, here's what you can ask. If you, if you buy into this idea of writing a not crappy job description and you see the benefits of knowing what you want and clarifying, what are you actually hiring this person to do? But now you're saying to yourself like, okay, well, how do I get started? This is how you get started. You ask yourself three questions. The first question is about getting off to an amazing start. So it's what does this person need to do to establish immediate credibility and trust with the team. Like what would make your team say two weeks in, hey, I know Sam's brand new, but he seems legit. And this is what I saw that made me see, made me say that he seems like he's legit. The second thing is, okay, now you got your feet under you and you're gonna knock some stuff down that makes the business better that you can brag about later. So in the first three to 12 months, and maybe even just in the first six months, if it's really all over the place, what are the three things that they need to do to be considered a success in the role? And the test here is it, is it controllable, impactful, and finishable? So can they control it? It's not like, can they turn around the macro economy so our business starts performing better? Like they need to have agency over this thing. It's impactful, which means it actually moves the needle on a number, ideally, that improves the business. And is it finishable? Can they say like, yes, there's more work to do, but like this part of the work is done. So what are the two or three things in the first six to 12 months that this person can do that passes that CIF test, controllable, impactful, finishable? And then the third question is, what are the essential skills or competencies that they need to hit the ground running and start working on that stuff right away? Another way to answer that, uh, ask that question is, what do they need to be uniquely great at to be able to accomplish those results? And sure, you're going to train people, people will ramp up over time, people will get better as they go, but they need to come in fully formed in at least a couple areas to be really effective. And this could be true of someone in their first job in the business world, but like you need to be good at something and have some level of mastery over something, even if it's just organizational or 
proactiveness or attitudinal, like pick those things they need to be uniquely great at. So if you answer those three questions, like immediate trust and credibility, what do they got to do? What are the three things they got to finish in the first year? And then what do they got to be good at? If you answer those things clearly and you write it down, you've kind of written 60% of a good performance profile. And then does that translate over to the job description? Do you just take that same kind of thing and, and drop that in? Or how do you think about that part of it? Yeah. Is it worth just showing it? Are we on are we Yeah, on we, video? Can. we can. We can. We can. We do full video on this. So yeah, if anyone watches is, on YouTube or... This would be... Uh, we'll, we'll describe it for people. So this is an example, right? This is a head of demand gen job. There's a, there's a reason I hit on this one because I was cheating and I had it you know, up on another screen. Um, the most important thing is the results that any new hire is going to create, right? Because even if everybody likes them, even if they fit into the team culture, if they can't make their part of the business better, you're always going to be asking them to do a little bit more. So I like to lead with those results. This is what we need from you. And it looks a little bit like a project plan and that's not a mistake, right? So in your first month as a demand gen marketer, like we just want you to become kind of like a native fluent speaker of our market. So spend time with sales team, spend time with the product team, figure out what the burning needs are on the sales team and come up with your no brainer content ideas that you'll help the team work on first. Then this is kind of a, uh, fix it up marketing situation. So we want you to get a grip on what we're doing today and then help us make the obvious improvements. So help us redefine what the heck an MQL is. We could have a whole <laughs> podcast conversation on that, but that's an important thing for this person to check the box on. What are the most important improvement opportunities? And then we want you to launch one of them, a quick win customer facing initiative. So again, controllable, impactful, finishable. And then in your first three months, like we can define what a marketing campaign looks like, but we want you to launch three of those marketing campaigns because in this company, we haven't gotten quite tight enough on kind of wave after wave of campaign. So we're looking for this person to bring a sense of rhythm to the organization. So we're really happy if this person comes in, develops a fingertip feel for our market and the needs of the sales team, gets a grip on our existing processes and tells them how to make them better and then gets us into a rhythm where we're out there in the market talking to our potential customers in a way that's attractive. Check, 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 right? But we also care about the style in which they do that mm -hmm. because this company has a unique culture um, and like there's good marketers and not so good marketers. And we think these things are gonna help you accomplish those outcomes on the left-hand side. So I won't read all these to people, but when I think about a really solid demand gen marketer, and we talked about this as a team, I think about someone who's a simplifier, not a complicator, right? Like speed matters. When we see an opportunity to get out there with a new campaign or a new idea or a tweak on something that we're doing today, I want someone who's thinking about how I can launch that tomorrow, not someone who's explaining why it's going to take a month to get it out there. And we both know the difference between those two people, right? That goes right into the pragmatism and speed point. I can't emphasize enough how important this is almost inside of every company, right? Like you could make the argument if you're doing PLG or something that's a little more hands-off from sales, but this person has to want to be kind of our head of sales apprentice, right? They want to know like, hey, what are the needs? What are the gaps? What's going on when you're in front of customers? What are the questions? What are the pain points? Like this person is there to make the sales team's job easier. And we want someone who embraces that role and like some of the frustrating work that it takes to do that well. And then we want someone who's data-driven. Like you don't need to be in a spreadsheet all day long, ignoring what's going on in the market, but you need to be comfortable with the numbers. And I don't want to have to be the one to convince you why you should track certain KPIs. The thing we've started doing recently, which is not in our hiring handbook, is this last section. So we're actually going to tell you, like, what are we most curious about? And we're thinking of this section as a sneak preview of the interview process. So we're actually going to tell you what's going to be on the test. And that's okay, because we're going to ask the questions in such a way and dig so deep that it's impossible to cheat. But if I'm an A player, I'm looking at these questions and I'm thinking through my past and through my stories and through my experiences at this point, and I'm saying to myself, 
hey, I've got a bunch of good stories that line up exactly with these questions and a bunch of strong opinions on how to do this job well that feels like it would play really well in this environment. So yeah, I do have some hot takes on the marketing mistakes that teams typically make. I do have two or three examples of quick launch campaigns that can just help fill gaps. I do have examples of the time that I've kind of siled up next to the expert on the product and use that to go do something great. And I do have two or three numbers that I look at every week to gauge my interest. So one is I, like, I think this is good manners, first of all. Like I, I don't think anybody should devote an hour of their life to a meeting, certainly a meeting where they're being judged, which is what an interview is, without a sneak preview of what they're gonna be asked, right? Because pop quizzes are great for high school Spanish, they're not so great for business settings and talent acquisition. But what this also does is it hits on a point that you hit on earlier, is like this stuff can be a little intimidating, right? On the left-hand side. Like if someone's gonna come in and knock all these things down, that's like A player stuff. And so we want something in here that sends a signal to people that like, hey, if you have answers to these questions, it's at least worth talking about what this role could look like full time for you. So this used to be a longer document with kind of missions, outcomes, competencies. And by talking to a bunch of candidates and just reflecting ourselves, one, we updated the format because it's a little bit easier to look at. One page is always better than two. Um, although I'm not always the most, uh, the best guy when it comes to brevity, but like, this is how you define a role. It's telling people what you need from them. It's telling people what they need to be great at, and it's giving them a sneak preview of what we're going to be most curious about in the talent acquisition process. And when you compare this against both the job descriptions that passive candidates are seeing and like the level of care that people are putting into their searches out there, it sends a signal that someone who's on the fence and saying, I'm pretty happy in my role. I like what I'm doing. I'm making enough money. There's a path for me here. That person, who is probably the person that you're looking for, by the way, is much more likely to throw their hat in the ring and say, I at least want to hear what these guys have to say. Because if nothing else, their approach to thinking about how this role fits in is unique and thoughtful. And I'm attracted by that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quarter page of notes. Let's do it. Go deep on this part. <laughs> Um, one, I love that it's in, you say, you know, it's simple. It's in one page format, but it's also in layman's terms. It's not filled with jargon. It's no. not filled with fluff. It's very readable. So if you're in marketing, you read that and you're just like, oh, okay, like I know exactly what they're asking for. It doesn't seem like you're trying to read legalese and it's written in like the 1600s, right? It's, it's straightforward. No it's translation to... necessary is what we say. Yeah. Like no, no translation necessary. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing is it. It sets expectations well. And this is a theme that I've been coming across a lot over the past couple of months is like everything comes back to how well do you set expectations, whether that's like with customers, with hiring, with your family life, anything. But it all comes back to how well you can map that out because that's what in those first 90 days, the things that you expect this person to accomplish. I really like that because one, it's it's right on the paper. You're going to know quickly, like what do they expect from me? And two, it gives you that sense of pretty quickly, do I qualify or disqualify myself from this? Can I see myself in the shoes of doing this type of thing? Have I done it? Does it excite me? Do I enjoy that? Is it a challenge? Like if you want to, you want an A player, they're looking at this like, Ooh, I love a good challenge. Toss that my way. Or you have some people are just like, that stresses me out just reading it. I think that I would just completely get clammy as I go through it. So that's a really good thing. And, and as part of like, especially if this is to attract inbound candidates of at least giving yourself a better shot of pulling in the people that might be most relevant for it before we even get into the sourcing side of things. Well, here's, so, here's a philosophical point. If you write mm -hmm. a performance profile the right way, it acts as your first interview for that reason that you just laid out. It's going to pull in the people that are excited about being challenged and being stretched who want to do things that they can brag about later. And it's gonna nudge away kindly, but firmly the people who just kind of want to come along for the ride and not really own anything or drive anything or make a huge impact. Mm -hmm. And it sends a powerful signal that like, Hey, we got a high bar and we're going to help you get there, but this is what we expect. Yeah. Um, and that attracts certain people and it repels other people. And I think that's exactly what you want uh, yeah. if you write it the right way. Mm -hmm. I love that. 
And then the what we're curious about section. That's brilliant. I, I really enjoy that because something that I found in our last organization is you have, when you get into those questions at the surface level, like what are two or three hot takes you have about why marketing doesn't work well? I have what you call the parrot people and then the detailed people. The parrot people know what to say because they listen to the right 100%. podcast. They follow the right influencers. 100%. But as soon as you get to that second order question, the third order question, they, they don't understand why they're making those recommendations, how you would execute on something within there. So is that what you get into a lot more with like the actual interview itself as you're saying like, here's what we're interested in, but how you can say someone can go research that. But as soon as you are in the interview, you're grilling them at that level where it's like, you can't fake that. It's the first question I ask in a first phone screen. So it's even before you get to a final slate. I don't ask people for their work history. I have their LinkedIn profile. I can see what they've mm -hmm. done. Like that's a waste of time. The first question I ask is one of the things we need this person to do in their first six months is X. Can you tell me about a time that you've done something similar? Yeah. There's nowhere to hide. Straightforward. Like, no. like, <laughs> like even if you haven't done it, the really good candidates can say, a really strong answer to that to someone who is, you know, making a little bit of a leap to a different role is, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't done that exact thing, but I can tell you this other story that I'm really proud of, I think has some similar principles that I would apply to that problem. Let me tell you that story and you can mm -hmm. tell me how far off the market is. And then you are looking for a story like for various, uh, technological and privacy limitations. We can't ask people for videotape of them on the job doing the thing that you would want them to do in their new company. If they could, I would ask for it. And maybe there's a place for that later on once we get into a more 1984 society. But if you can't have videotape, what do you need to ask for? You need to ask for detailed storytelling of this was the setup. This is what I did. This was the result. This was the lesson that I learned. And that's what I ask for. And that's impossible to fake. Um, mm -hmm. and so I tell people up front, I actually send them a cheat sheet ahead of a final round interview. And I say, this is what you're going to expect. I'm going to ask a lot of follow-up questions. It's not indicative of anything. All I want is a lot of detail. And since I can't watch that videotape of you on the job, I want it in verbal form. And so I'm going to interrupt you at times politely. I'm going to ask you for more detail. I'm going to redirect you. I'm going to ask you to double click on things. I'm going to ask you to take me inside your head during parts of the story but you're right. It's not just the second order question. It's the, it's the third and fourth and fifth order question um, that tells you like, one, did the person actually do this? Uh, because another way of saying what you said earlier is knowing what to do and actually making it happen are two totally different things. And there's a lot of people out there who have armed themselves with the concepts and know what to do, but haven't actually done it in practice, at least in the way that you need them to in this role. Um, so yeah, it's, it's asking really detailed, tell me about a time and then not being satisfied with a surface level answer. And the thing is really good candidates appreciate it because they get to an end of an interview and they tell you, because I've been told this a hundred times, I'm really tired, but I'm really energized. I'm really tired because you made me give you a lot of detail, but I'm really energized because in an hour or two hours, if it's a final round, I just went through the entire highlight reel of my career, the stuff that I'm most proud of and the stuff that lights me up and the stuff that 10 years from now, I'm still going to be bragging about. And there's a special kind of energy around that when you can pull that out of people um, and give them a chance to showcase what they can do. So mm -hmm. we're getting into the be structured part of the, of the, of the framework, but I think the point is when you write a good performance profile, when you're clear about what you want and when you sneak preview what you're going to ask people about, one, it's impossible to cheat if you do it the right way. And two, it can be a sneaky, attractive part of the marketing and selling exercise because you are giving people the space to talk about the stuff that they're most proud of. And the really, really good candidates love that. Mm -hmm. So knowing a lot of our listeners are agency recruiters, executive um, searchers. What do you do if you aren't that person that has all of that industry niche uh, job function skill set? How do you do you have to have like a panel interview so you can get someone in there that understands what are those questions that they need to be asking to get the details out? Or is that like, is that something that you can research beforehand as the is their interview? Or do you need that subject matter expert to be able to pull that out? I think it's 
you need to create a rubric of some kind. So this is part of being structured, but mm -hmm. like asking good questions isn't enough. You need to align on at least what are the ingredients to a good versus bad answer. So we take this step before every final round interview. We sit down and we say, this is the question that we're asking. Let's throw out in a semi-caffeinated way, what would a bad answer be and what would a good answer be? And we write that down and we score the answers on a scale of one to four. Like one is hell no and four is hell yes. And twos and threes are more mild versions of no or yes, but you force people to take a stance either no or yes. Um, so if you build that rubric ahead of time, I think you can ask for help either from the internet or from people that you know, but what you're looking for is like the tells of whether someone has done it and whether someone has, for the most part, like high standards and the means to detect if they're being met um, on the candidate side. So if you get really, really specific, like you do need to enlist the help of other people to figure out like, what am I listening for? And what is the mm -hmm. non-negotiable thing? It's a little bit easier when they're like universal quality. So if you're asking about something related to being data-driven or a team player or proactive or organized, like those are pretty easy to find. If you're interviewing a really specialized CTO who's, you know, coding something in .NET or whatever it is, and you need, like, you're listening for this thing, like, yeah, I'm going to call Jim, my fellow operating partner on the tech side and, and make sure that he's either in the room, ideally, uh, or that he's giving me a sense of what should be on the rubric. So knowing what you want, deciding what to ask in advance and taking the extra step of, like what would be a hell no and a hell yes? And what domain specific nuggets do I need to incorporate into that rubric? Um, that can save you from a lot. And the other thing is just, if people can't get past that level of abstraction, if they're staying at the conceptual level of like, hypothetically, here's what I would do. And you keep asking the question of like, no, but tell me what actually happened like in a detailed way. The number one predictor of a hire that doesn't work out is someone who can't tell you specifically what they've done or how they did it or get into that detail. Because if you think about it, that inability to get into the weeds and be a clear thinker or communicator, it's going to translate to how they look at your business. It's going to translate to how they build plans. It's going to translate to how they communicate with their team. It's going to translate to everything, mm -hmm. right? So they're telling you who they are when they can't do that. All you got to do is believe them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, they can look good on paper, but again, especially you can't afford to make a bad hire. Don't make that mistake. Everyone's made that mistake once they scrape their knees, they learn the lesson, but yeah, not a, not a fun one. All right. We're going to stay on the structured part before we go back to finding your own candidates. Yep. One thing I've heard you talk about before is you assess fit within the, the interviews themselves. So you ask questions like, why is this exciting for you? Why does this seem like it's a good opportunity for you right now? Um, and you've even said like, what do you want to do more or less of in your next job? So what are you getting after with those types of questions? Like, what are they telling you that are so powerful as you, as you are comparing these candidates to others by asking this? So I ask, especially in initial phone screens, I ask it in a very specific way. And I ask it the same way in a final round interview, which sounds like a very redundant sentence, but let me explain why the hell I just said that. Um, the way I ask it is I say, based on what you know about the position so far, just tell me why this and why now. And I'm looking for three things coming out of that question. One is, have they done any research at all? So the really good candidates will tell you what they know about the company and the position, what they don't know, and also what they can assume. So that's actually like a sneaky level of testing for problem solving ability and like breaking down the context mm -hmm. of the situation. I'm never going to boot someone just for that, but the really good candidates will glom onto that and say, here's the information I took from the job description. Here's the information I took from the website and here's what I still don't know. Right. So they'll lay that out for you and you can tell that someone can break things down with a framework just by asking that first based on what you know so far. And then why this and why now is you're looking for clear evidence of motivation and how it fits into kind of their concept of their career journey or the next step or whatever it is. And I'm looking for like clarity and vulnerability in the answer, right? Because one, they don't know everything. Two, I like people who feel like 
they're challenging themselves by chasing this role and stretching themselves and kind of reaching for it a little bit. Selfishly, as an operating partner, because those people are more willing to tap into the collective knowledge of our portfolio and me as the person who helps our companies versus someone who's like, I got it all figured out. I've done this before. I'm just looking to do it again. It makes a lot of sense, like full stop. And again, I'm not making talent acquisition decisions just based on that, but it's an important data point that I am looking for. Like what is the growth mindset and open-mindedness of this person? And like, are they going to get after it when they get in the role? Like how excited are they to do this job? Or are they just looking for a place where they can punch the clock and kind of use the you know, cemented skills that they have in the exact same way. So I don't think it's a magic question. I don't think that's like a particularly huge unlock. But when you ask people to lay out what they do and don't know about the role and how that fits with what they're good at, what they want to do, and like the broader arc of where they're at, one, you figure out who's a really good communicator right off the bat. Two, you figure out who, how introspective this person is. And three, you figure out how structured and open-minded they are. Um, and like, none of that is unuseful, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And those are all these the things to almost come back to the find your own candidate section where you see on everyone's resume, problem solver, hard worker, team totally. player. And it's so easy to put on paper. So this is one way that you can start to validate some of that. But Another point that you, you've brought up before is, is you'd like to basically say, I can find an A player through interviews if they have strong problem solving abilities and they have a strong sense of conscientiousness. Yep. So how, like, again, those are two things. You put them on a resume on paper. It means absolutely yep. nothing. Is there a way that you've, before the interview, have you found any signals for that when you are starting to try to source candidates for that? Or is it something you have to wait until you get into that first call with them? I try not to because like, I don't know. Bias is a hard thing, right? When you, when you have a hundred resumes to go through yep. and you can't interview everyone, like you have to be a little bit biased in a way of like, we're going to accept these people and not choose to talk to these people. And it's not unfair bias, but it is like pattern recognition. Like mm -hmm. have they done something similar before? Are they the correct kind of stage of their career? Um, have they led teams that look like ours in the past? All things. So it's like hiring is hard and you're doing it at an arm's length and you don't know these people at a cellular level. So you need to use your pattern recognition skills to figure out like who even makes it into the process. Um, like... I think it's totally different depending on the market and depending on the company and depending on just the context in which you exist. I can tell you what works for us and some of the things that I look for. Again, these are not non-negotiables, but I start to get excited when I see them. I like to see people who have been through an organization that has really high standards for one stop of their career. And then I like to also see that same person go and apply those standards to a smaller, more emerging company before they get to us. Uh, a lot of people who've been really successful and have been able to make kind of like game-changing impact really quickly are the ones who have been through the ringer, um, you know, not necessarily in strategy consulting, but maybe it's at a big tech company that really knows what good looks like and impresses the standards upon you. And then they've had to go into a more figure it out situation where there's a good product, but there's not a lot of structure. And then they get to us. And the exciting part about that model and that pedigree is like they kind of have the ingredients of most high performers that I see. It's a two-part test. Do they have really high standards? And do they have the means to detect if those standards are being met? So I don't think you can totally say, yes, this person has both of those just by looking at a resume or just by mm -hmm. looking at their background. But, you know, when you're looking at a hundred resumes, you can allow yourself to get excited about some candidates. And I get excited when I see people come from places that do it right. And then go to companies that haven't done it yet. 
mm-hmm. and help them go figure it out. And then they get to us because that's kind of what we need in our portfolio. Yeah. And I would say you can see an aspect of that on the resume. If you know those companies that are setting the bar. Yeah. And then you go see the next company. It's a smaller one or something else. And they have a short tenure, four months, six months, eight months. Yep. You can guess wasn't the right match. Something happened. I mean, there's always, again, circumstances. You can't completely reduce bias. Or are they 18 months in and they're still there? 24 months in, they're still there. Um, and that's a sense of like, they've obviously done something well. If they want to stick around, you know, they're a high performer. They're not sticking around just because they're content with what they're currently doing. Yeah. And, and you're hitting on another point, which, you know, is maybe the, the clearest signal that they're at least worth talking to, which is called the achiever pattern, right? So if they've been promoted multiple times, if they have longer tenures at a couple places, if they keep getting more and more responsibility or impact or, you know, they're kind of selected for special mm-hmm. projects. Like that is something, especially at the individual contributor or manager level, when you're talking about trying to um, kind of spot the early career winners who have a lot of potential, that's a big predictive thing because there's people that have that and and they don't. If there's people with a year here, nine months here, six months here, one year here, just one title versus someone who's had two companies they've worked for, they've been promoted three or four times in each of those companies. Like we both know which of those candidates you're more excited about, at least on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Okay. I'm going to drop one quote from you that I heard on a previous podcast Uh on the the finding your own candidates. It's a good one. Don't worry. I'm going to make you sound really smart here. (laughs) And then we'll get into the the feedback loop. All right. So the quote that I heard you say was, I think about talent pipelines, like I think about revenue pipelines. If you're getting them from multiple sources, that's better than a single source. And it's certainly less risky. So I know every recruiter that's listening to this right now is just like, yes, thank Duh. you. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the quote <laughs> that I can go and share with the hiring manager who only wants to post to job boards or to LinkedIn or anything else. But yep. again, I think everyone listening is just like, yeah, obviously. So I don't think we need to add much more to that, but I do want to get into this feedback part. So at the beginning of the conversation, I have an asterisk in my notes saying we were going to talk about that feedback loop and iterating and everything else. So let's talk about that part where it's like, how do you learn from the hires that you made? So I'll let you start with this. I have a couple small rabbit holes that we'll get into, but I just want to hear you take it from the top once you get to to this portion. Yeah, there's two ways that we check and I'm sure there's more, but my my overarching point is don't do nothing, right? There, there's a lot of companies that don't check if their hiring process is working and don't check what it feels like to be a candidate. So I think you should do both, but at least check if your hiring process is working. And the easiest way to do that is just connect your performance management process with your hiring process. So if you have any kind of review or you run a nine box or whatever it is, um, just check like, who did you hire this year? How are they doing? And put that data away and then go look at it next year and look at it the year after. And you will start to see like, is this any good or, or do we need to examine how we're bringing people in? Um, Mm -hmm. It's a little tougher to do when the numbers are really small, but I like to say, you know, when I talk to my sales leaders, I say data is only as good as the conversation it creates. So even if the numbers are really small, even if you're only talking about a couple of people asking yourself, who did we hire and how are they doing is the perfect jumping off point to have a short introspective conversation about your hiring process and where it might be going wrong. So that's number one is just like, you owe it to yourself to ask yourself, is the hiring process working and make it a conversation because you're going to discover something you can do better. And that is gold. Um, The second thing is like, if at all possible, and it's an extra step and it's annoying and not everybody does it, but ask candidates, how was it to be interviewed by us? And there's a bunch of good interview questions out there that you can ask. Like if you want a book on this Lazlo box work rules, Lazlo ran people operations at Google for a number of years. He knows what he's talking about. Um, there's great questions in, in that, but at the very minimum, what makes a good interviewing process? Your interviewer was prepared, like they showed up on time, they seemed ready, they knew what they were gonna ask you, the interview seemed fair and unbiased, and like they made you feel like a human. So you can ask any question to get at those three things, but if you're showing up 
if you're being polite, if you're prepared and you're human in your interview process, like you're doing a good job uh, and you owe it to yourself to ask if those things are happening. So a lot of companies out there don't do any of that. And it can be a very, very simple, very short, very easy step to first connect your performance management process with your hiring process and just ask how are our new hires are performing and is there anything to learn from that? And the second thing is like, you owe it to yourself to get an honest answer of what it feels like to be a candidate. And you're going to get some noise, especially from people that weren't successful in getting, in getting a new position. But again, the data is not there to make robotic decisions for you. The data is there to have a conversation with. Love this. So obviously, yes, don't do nothing. Reminds me of forgetting Sarah Marshall. You can't do nothing. You have to yeah. do something. Do more than yeah. that. Pop up. Yeah. yeah. Got to do more. Um, the data side of me is totally loving this right now because it's, yeah, you, when you say you're, you're consolidating it down to the last year. So it is, it's the net new hires. And within that time frame, you should be able to understand one, like from the cohort, you can compare 2023 cohort, 2022 cohort, 2021 cohort. And like, what were the variables at play there? Was it a different sourcing person? Was it a different hiring manager? What was different within the business? Were we trying to fill more roles and we lowered our standards or anything else? So yeah, I do like that. As you say, is you can spot the trends pretty quickly. So what happens if you start to see that trend going down? Like, what are some of the, the signals that you're recommending to your team, to um, one of your portfolio companies when you start to see this? Um, I mean, it, it all, it kind of all comes back to like keeping the bar high, right? If that trend starts to go down, what typically happens? Like you weren't following a good hiring process. You either did the, I know a guy thing, or you didn't write a good job description or you compromised or things were crazy. So you didn't really run a process and you just took the person that you were looking for. So it's not meant as a uh, indictment of individual managers. Mm -hmm. It's just like, let's get curious about the conditions that created this and ask ourselves the question, like, is there any way for us to change those conditions? Mm -hmm. So if things were crazy and either the company was going gangbusters or going through a really tough transition and the context was just really, really tough, Maybe there isn't nothing. And maybe it's just like, this is a blip and it's a weird year and like, we're not going to do it again. And this is a good sanity check. Um, but oftentimes like the result of that conversation is some form of like, yeah, we need to keep the bar higher. And here's the part of the process that we can use to keep the bar high. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's training. Sometimes it's like resolving to write better job descriptions. Sometimes it's hiring a talent acquisition person to take the load off of some of the managers and get you to a stronger slate. Sometimes it's making a decision to use more recruiting firms because like, yeah, we saved some money, but like it, it hurt us in the end. Um, so there's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. It's just like nothing bad ever happens from being curious about how this is going mm -hmm. and nothing bad ever happens by having a conversation accompanied with data that tells you, what the results have actually been and it's mm -hmm. extra work and it's annoying to do that extra work, but the yield is very, very high. And I will also tell you, this is not the reason to do it, but I guarantee your board would love to see this data, especially if you come to them with not only the data, but the conclusions from the data. And especially if you're, you know, a COO or a people ops person, that's looking for how to have a data during conversation with the board, this is a great place to start. Hey, every year we hire people. This is something we should be good at. Are we good at it? And are we getting better or worse? Those are knowable, answerable questions with quantifiable results. And chances are you aren't looking at it the way that you should. Yeah. So for our recruiters, I know a lot of them right now are, are looking at the industries that are slow on hiring and they're trying to think, how do I make the most of the existing clients that I have? You just said the board will love this, the shareholders, whoever it is at the, the top of the food chain of your clients, if you can work with them to help them understand and do this type of assessment, that's another one. As a recruiter, you can make money off this. This is another offering. Add it to your, your stack here. But two, you want to talk about a way to get away from just being a recruiter and into a true talent advisor. I mean, this is this is a phenomenal analysis that you can provide that has them looking at you like we need to keep them around to help us with this, especially looking over long time periods. Yeah. If you excommunicated me from private equity right now, don't please. I like what I'm doing. <laughs> and you, you said like, go make money by selling to heads of people ops. I would say I'm going to structure a hiring effectiveness assessment that starts with analyzing the data for you 
of your last three years of hires and how they're doing on your performance management rubric. And I'll give you some recommendations for what to do different in your hiring process. And yes, I'm going to recommend that you work with me as a search firm as part of that recommendation, but I'm also going to give you some pragmatic things that you can do when I'm not around that can help you miss less because this is all about missing less. Yeah. So hopefully for the listeners that are still sticking on with us as we're, we're coming up on that hour mark, you just got the absolute nugget right there. So yeah, I love that recommendation. Um, and then, yeah, to bring it all back around is it's just this feedback iterative loop. So we are both saying like a playbook shouldn't ever just be set in stone. You write it once and no. then you hold to it. But it's this concept of it's written out. It's what works best right now. But tomorrow this might be out of date and it should some part of this should be out of date. I used to tell our, our team and our agency is like, if there's no recommendations to this document after 30 days, we're doing something wrong. Totally. So how do you, like, I mean, things change in hiring, obviously with just the, the nature of the market roles, companies change and everything else. Uh, so how are you, like, how do you think about incorporating feedback that you get from the performance reviews, from the candidate feedback and everything else into the recommendations that you provide? Yeah. The first thing I do is just ask, like we, we do a calibration after every senior management hire. So we'll, instead of talking about how did that go in the interview, we'll send the rubric to everybody who just finished the interview, put your scores in. So we blindly see everybody's results. And then we talk about them with the numbers mm -hmm. in front of us. And at the end of those conversations, it's a natural space to say, Hey, was there anything about the, the interview process that we should change? And, you've already seen a couple of things that we've changed as a result of that feedback. So we've changed how our performance profiles look. That's a, that's a big shift from where we started four years ago. And that came from the feedback from one of our CEOs who said, I love the performance profile. It's a lot of text guys. It's like three pages. And I can tell that Paul wrote it cause it's way too long. And I'm like, Ooh, that cut me deep, but you're exactly right. Let's get it onto one page. The other thing that we've done is we've taken final round interviews, especially for CEOs and senior management hires, and we've split them down the middle. So instead of just doing a behavioral panel for three hours, we'll do three or four questions, go really deep on tell me about a time or hypotheticals, how would you approach this? And then we'll give them a homework assignment. And the research would tell you that those two techniques when combined together are way more predictive of a good hire than just the behavioral interview. But it also allows us to see an executive in the state um, that we interact with them quite often, which is like the boardroom, right? Like we want to see how good you are at pulling up after three months of work, getting everything together in the chaos of an emerging tech business and saying, this is the number one challenge that we're trying to tackle. And this is the plan and the approach for tackling that challenge. And the way that we do that is we just give them you know, some subset of the board deck. If we have to scrub some numbers, we scrub some numbers and we ask them some very simple questions. Come back to us and tell us what seems most important, how you would overcome that challenge and how you would uh, enlist the rest of the team to go help you figure it out. And some people hit that in five minutes and it's very clear that it's surface level. And some people come back with incredibly thoughtful and insightful plans and in the best case, we get to the end of their homework assignment and we just say, cool, we love you. We need you to go do that inside the company because this is real data and a real situation. And this is exactly what we're hiring you to do. Okay. One, I love that. I'm a huge proponent of these kind of like homework assignments at the right time, but this is a very hot topic in, in the recruiting space. So hearing that you're even saying you're doing this for CEOs, I'm sure there's a bunch of executive search firms that are kind of on the fence about this. Do we take up their time? They're already a CEO somewhere else. Are they even going to be open to doing an assignment like this? What's the response been that you've seen when you're asking them to take these home? Are you setting any guardrails around like, don't spend more than 30 minutes on this? Or like, just, yeah. just out of curiosity, I'm sure a lot of people are probably going to hear this and be like on the edge of their seats waiting to hear what you're about to say. Um, the, <laughs> the, um, I'm trying to bring some self-awareness to this answer. I'm sure we don't hear the complaints, right? Because we're the investor. These are tough jobs to get. They're trying to put their best foot forward. I'm sure there's more grumbling behind the scenes than there is in front of me. And I don't really care. Um, like this is giving people who we're going to spend the next five years doing really hard stuff with 
a chance to tell us how committed they are, a chance to showcase how smart they are, and a chance to like authentically put their fingerprints on a business that they haven't joined yet. And the really good people get excited about that because they know it's an opportunity for them to shine. And the people who are really averse to it or the people who complain about it, like maybe we miss out on one or two candidates because they don't want to do the two hour, three hours of work to do a homework assignment. And that's fine with me. Uh, and you know, there's probably easier CEO jobs to get than the ones in our portfolio, but I will tell you executives in our portfolio need to know what they're doing. Like they need to have functional expertise either as the CEO or their corner of the business that they're running, but they also need to have energy for the job. Cause this is really hard. Like trying to finish the work that the founder started and trying to take a company from here to there and trying to like change the way that things have been done often for decades is exhausting hand to hand combat and it takes energy and it takes spark and it takes, I don't know, you just got to wake up and be excited about it. And so if you're not excited to do the homework assignment, that isn't even the job yet, you're going to have a tough time when you're in the trenches doing the stuff that we love to do and the stuff that's going to help improve this business. And mm -hmm. so that isn't on the rubric anywhere. It isn't something we grade people on, but it's an important signal that we're sending that like, you not only need to be good at this, you need to be excited about it. And I think we've subconsciously structured the assessment. So we see that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I've actually realized that until now. So thanks for the, thanks for the epiphany. Through That's what I'm here for. Hey, yeah. this podcast was worth it at this point. Yeah. But yeah, those are some of those things, the intangibles that are so hard to see on a resume, but they do come out in time. And again, it's not going to show up on the rubric, but startup, like you have to have energy. And also you see a lot of CEOs in big company where they, they get bloated egos. Are they still willing to roll up their sleeves to do what needs to be done to be successful? Because again, you're not a public company at this point. <laughs> we have 18 months to prove that we can grow, that we can do this. Otherwise we're out of money. We're not going to get our next round. So yeah. having that type of thing, it's like, oh, two hours, whatever. That's fine. Like eat that for breakfast, you know? So I do, I think it's interesting the way that you phrased that there and hopefully that allows some of our listeners to be okay when they think about, should we, should we not be doing this as part of executive search as part of, you know, these very strategic niche hires? Are we going to be ruling ourselves out by asking them to do too much? Yeah. I don't think so. Th the way I would frame it up is you need to think about it as much as an energy test, as an aptitude test. And if you don't think the energy part is important, then don't do it. But the best people in my portfolio, the ones that I brag about, the ones that I hire multiple times at multiple companies, the ones that like make me proud, um, they're not just smart. They have incredible energy and they're excited about the very unique type of work that goes on inside of a Parker Gale portfolio company. And so some people complain about the assessment that I use to search for that unique kind of energy. Like, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Oh, well, you need that very specific person. So, all right, Paul, I know I've kept you, kept you long. I think this is a great spot to wrap. So one, I just want to thank you for joining. This was so helpful, impactful. I know at first take, a lot of our listeners are probably like, well, Paul's not a recruiter. Why are you having him on the show? But now I think after listening to this episode, <laughs> they're like, thank God Paul just joined for that show. So, um, I've got two pages of notes already for this one. I'm excited to review it, to listen back to this again. So thank you for coming on and, and taking the time to, to share all that with us. Thanks, man. You ask great questions. Let's do it again. Yeah, absolutely. So um, before we wrap, for those people who want to um, find you, learn about you, learn about Parker Gale, like any any shout outs that you want to give for, for helpful places to find content? Yeah, parkergale.com. We post a lot of stuff there. We'll tell you all about the things that we invest in. Um, and a lot of our playbooks and, and content is there. We reference the hiring handbook a lot in this conversation. If you Google Parker Gale, how we hire, if I've done my job in SEO, which I think I have, that should pop right up at the top of the results. If it doesn't, let me know. I may have more, some work to do. And this is the stuff that I write about a lot. I've, I've published 50 or 60 essays, playbooks, and videos in the last three years about how I do my job and the stuff that seems to work for me in our portfolio companies. And that's all over at my blog, which is called Hello Operator. And that's on Substack. So if you Google Hello Operator, Substack, Paul Stanzik, uh, that should pop right up too. But if you don't see that stuff, 
let me know because maybe I got to update my digital footprint. <laughs> I'll help you out. I'll link to it in the show notes as yeah, well. Good deal. So. All right, Paul. Well, um, final, final wrapping spiel for us. Becoming a Hiring Machine is a production of Loxo. If you really like this episode and you're not sure where to go next, we've got a link to a similar one in the show notes. Uh, you can find those in your favorite podcast stream platform as well as on our website, loxo.co slash podcast. We did go over some video stuff today, so check those out on, on YouTube, on our website. We've got the video clips there. And if you ever have questions, you want to hear us take on a certain topic, send them to us, podcast at loxo.co. So, all right, everyone. That was a phenomenal interview with Paul Stancic. Until next time, bye, y'all. <laughs>